All right, my friends, welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton. My uh, website is weekendinterviewshow.com. If anybody wants to check out the archives, keep them all in MP3 format for you there. If you're driving around and you're almost where you're going, check out rbnlive.com, streaming on the Internet worldwide. And my next guest is Peter Lance. He is an award-winning reporter, novelist, and screenwriter. He's the author of the books, a Thousand Years for Revenge, International Terrorism, and the FBI, The Untold Story, and Cover Up, What the Government is Still Hiding About the War on Terror. Welcome to the show, sir. Great to be with you, Scott. Uh, it's good to have you on, sir. I've uh, been meaning to interview you for quite some time now, uh, actually. Uh, let's see. Let's start with uh, Cover Up. You have a book called Cover Up, What the Government is Still Hiding About the War on Terror. Uh, it's your assertion that our government is covering up something, sir? Well, you know something, I started with, uh, right after 9-11, uh, investigating the cause of 9-11 to ask him. All right, everybody, it's a weekend interview show. I'm Scott, and something is terribly wrong with Peter Lance's phone, so we're going to get that straightened out. I'm looking at the front page of antiwar.com here, of course, and there's nothing but bad news. Uh, first of all, the big picture is 17 bombs kill 50 in Iraq, including three GIs. That's a story about what happened yesterday. Uh, from the Associated Press, 17 different bombings yesterday, 50 killed, including three American GIs. And then today, already new bombs going off, 11 Iraqis and seven American soldiers killed already today. So that's the, um, the wonderful war in Iraq brought to you by the neoconservatives. And let's see if I click on casualties of war. I think we're up to 1,581 Americans dead in combat so far, at least according to the government. And uh, let's see if I can click. IraqBodyCount.com says the minimum number of Iraqi civilians killed so far, absolute minimum, is 21,239. And you can find that at IraqBodyCount.com, and you can find the casualties in Iraq page at Antiwar.com. Do we have Peter Lance back on the phone there? All right, Peter, let's try this again. We've got a headline this time. All right, yeah, let's try and uh, see if we can get your first little statement in here before yeah, the first break. Uh, Rika, so uh, I began an inquiry into the cause of 9-11, and I focused primarily on the Southern District of New York with the Federal Prosecutor's Office and the FBI Office in New York, which are considered the offices of origin of all the bin Laden cases. And the, the New York, uh, the FBI was given domestic terrorism prevention uh, by President Reagan back in 18, uh, 1983. The first joint terrorist task force was created in the Southern District in 1980. And all, virtually all of the evidence in the war, what we collectively refer to as the war on terror, the repository of all that intelligence and evidence is in these two offices in New York City. And because there were a series of legal cases, Scott, where they prosecuted various people connected with uh, terrorist acts like the original World Trade Center bombers, etc. There was an, uh, you could at least go in and look at the transcripts, you could look at the evidence, and you could do something right. to assess the threat. The, the, okay, the, hold, the, hold it hold it right there. PeterLance.com. We'll be right back, everybody. Can we talk? Can we talk? Can we talk about gun control? Gun control? Seems like it should work, doesn't it? It should work. You'd think so. Yeah. How's it going, my friends? I'm Scott Horton, host of the Weekend Interview Show, and I'm talking with Peter Lance. He's an investigative reporter and author of the book Thousand Years for Revenge. When you look it up, it's 1,000 spelled out in numbers, years for revenge. And uh, his website is PeterLance.com. Now, uh, we don't have too much time, sir, really, uh, with all the breaks and everything. We only got about 45 minutes or something like that. So, basically, um, I want you to just tell your story, and I'm going to try to keep my mouth shut as best I can. Uh, why don't you just basically start with, um, quickly, American intervention in Afghanistan in the 1970s. Yeah, and just I guess you start to play the music prior to the commercial, so I'll know when to... Sure, you got 30 seconds when the music starts. Good, perfect. So anyway, um, what essentially when I went back and I tracked this, 
uh, how I went back 12 years to look at how the, the FBI, in particular the Justice Department, did or did not help to prevent the war, you know, various acts of terror, uh, specifically 9-11. And what I found, Scott, was astonishing. There weren't just a dozen, uh, you know, screw-ups or missteps over the years, but there were dozens and dozens. And what I included in this new book that I'm about to start at least the point that I'm already springing off from this new book, is that there were intentional acts of cover-up by high-ranking people in both the New York office of the FBI and the Justice Department, where they built their own walls, they created their own stovepipes, and they intentionally failed to connect the dots that would have helped other agencies or other oversight committees on the Hill understand the full al-Qaeda threat. Now, sir, is it your assertion that they did that strictly to cover themselves or because they were... Uh basically aiding and abetting the terrorist acts. Well, it, it, they, they, you know, ironically, they're both, both things are possible because in, in covering themselves, in covering up the negligence in the New York office of the FBI, uh, and for example, the failure to stop Ramzi Youssef, the original World Trade Center bomber, they clearly could have stopped him in the fall of 02 prior to the bomb that killed six and injured a thousand. And because Youssef, I've proven my both books, was the, was the architect of 9-11, and his uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, merely carried out Ramzi's plan. If they had stopped Youssef in 1992 on the watch of George Herbert Walker Bush, they would have interdicted 9-11. Youssef was an outside-the-box thinker, a criminal genius, and, and he was the one that created this whole planes-as-missiles uh, plot. Uh, so what they did was, and the effect of that was, by protecting themselves, they were aiding and abetting the enemy. But even more specifically, what they ended up doing was, they uh, basically had a, a fellow named Ali Muhammad who was an al-Qaeda spy who had borrowed himself. This guy literally, uh, quick strokes on Ali Muhammad. Ali Muhammad had been in the Egyptian military. His, his unit was the unit that killed Anwar Sadat in 1981. His excuse, his alibi at the time, was that he was at Fort Bragg instructing the Green Berets down in North Carolina. He later uh, left the Egyptian Army, became to America, married an American woman, joined the U.S. Army, ended up back at, Green, at uh, Fort Bragg, lecturing the Green Berets, members of Delta Force, the Army Rangers, the elite of the elite in the U.S. Army, lecturing them on Islamic culture. While at the same time, in 1989, while he was active duty U.S. military, he would come up on weekends, uh, four successive weekends in August, and do paramilitary training to these men that later became the al-Qaeda cell in New York City. And, uh, and on four weekends, the FBI Special Operations Group, the elite black bag unit that got Gotti, photographed these men firing AK-47s and other weapons out in Long Island, a half an hour north of the Hamptons, and literally were on to these guys and then just closed the investigation in 1989. Of the men photographed, Three went on to bomb the World Trade Center, were convicted. One was convicted with Blind Shake Rockbond trying to blow up the bridges and tunnels around Manhattan, plus the U.N. headquarters and FBI headquarters. One of them was um, killed Rabbi Meir Kahani in 1990, which I contend is the first al-Qaeda blood spilled on American soil. And their leader, this guy Ali Muhammad, went on to literally scout the African embassies in 1994, he took the pictures of the Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya embassy where bin Laden pointed and said, I want the suicide truck bomb to go here. And that, of course, when a bomb went off with the, almost simultaneous to the bomb in Ethiopia at the embassy in August 7th of 1998, nine years later, with 224 dead and 4,000 injured. So here's the FBI's New York office, the best of the best, with these guys on their radar screen in 1989 when George Bush's father was in the White House, and for eight years of the Clinton administration, extraordinary acts of negligence that lead all the way up to the day of 9-11 and beyond during Bush, the younger Bush's presidency. So, you know, this you have to say after a while, Scott, when you see this time and time again, you go, my God, in the beginning maybe it's ignorance or failure to appreciate the threat. But after a while, by 1996, there is no doubt they had chapter and verse in al-Qaeda. They knew exactly who they were, what their intent was. They had a defector named Jamal al-Fadl who literally came in and gave them the family jewels. The CIA had them in the beginning of the year. The FBI had them in December of 96. They knew everything, and yet... Uh, they continued to trust this guy, Ali Muhammad, who was just shining them on while he learned the true capabilities of the U.S. intelligence agencies to thwart the al-Qaeda threat. Um, 
Only after the bombings, a couple of weeks after the African embassy bombings, did they ever pull this guy over. They arrested him. Then, for eight months, they had a secret arraignment. They never charged him, hoping they could cut a deal. And they finally made a plea deal with him. To this day, we don't know where he is. He's not in the prison system. He may never have been sentenced. And, uh, you know, he's the Oracle of Delphi in U.S. custody that could have prevented 9-11, that could have told our government. Remember, they had him 98, okay, 99, 2000, 2001. They had this guy three years before the 9-11 attacks in custody uh, and with tremendous, you know, potential jail time or death sentences hanging over his head, and they could have gotten out of him the truth behind the 9-11 attacks, and they failed to do so. Well, let's rewind a little bit and talk about the war in Afghanistan and how it was that our allies, the Mujahideen freedom fighters, became our enemies. Well, the, as you remember, the, the, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, the, uh, the United States decided uh, wisely, as it turned out historically, it turned out to be a smart decision with respect to the Soviets, that this was going to, the Soviets were going to be bogged down in this country the way we were in Vietnam, and that by aiding the Mujahideen rebels, we would be helping to defeat the evil empire, as Reagan, you know, portrayed the Russians and the Soviets. So, and it turned out to be true. We supplied at least three billion in aid, military aid, covertly. The Saudis uh, reportedly matched it dollar for dollar. The truth is that there were probably billions and billions more. And we went through, in particular, a, a warlord named Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, and. He had, would distribute this U.S. aid to the Mujahideen, including at one point 500 Stinger missiles. When we gave them the Stinger missiles, that gave them tremendous capability against the Soviet hind gunships, you know, the helicopter gunships that were being so much of a threat to them. So eventually the Soviets pull out in 1989 and the, and, you know, they're defeated. And, uh, yet instead of focusing on that area, the theater of operations and, and, you know, realizing that we had trained many of these Mujahideen and we had given them, made them, turn them into incredible warriors and armed them, we just turned our back on that theater of operations. And, uh, you know, we're looking at the Saddam Hussein and the Gulf War in 1981, you know, and so during that, that period from 1989 to the invasion of the Gulf War, we just ignored that theater of ops, and they, we didn't understand, appreciate radical Islam, Wahhabism. We didn't understand that these guys saw us as the next great evil empire to defeat, and we turned our backs, and it, it came down. Well, we kind of left early, too, didn't we? If I remember right, Reagan made the deal with Gorbachev that as soon as the Russians begin pulling out, we will completely pull all of our guys out. And if I remember right, the Russian-controlled government stayed in power in Kabul for another year and a half. So... Not only had we trained these Mujahideen guys, but we had sort of left them high and dry with a knife in the back, too. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't really know that that's true, because I don't think we ever admitted we were there. So I don't know how Reagan, and Gorb Reagan could have told Gorbachev we'll pull our guys out. Oh, I thought that that was the deal that they had made in 89. Maybe that's not right. Well, I'll, I'll have to look into that myself. I'm not sure. I, I, we were there covertly. We, we had advisors in Peshawar and other places, but I don't know that the U.S. was ever officially there, so I don't know. But the, 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 the sum product of the thing was that we ignored that, uh, the threat from what they came to call Afghan Arabs. Now, the, the war, of, the Mujahideen's war against the Soviets is like the Spanish Civil War of Islam. It united, uh, it, uh, you know, Islamics from the Philippines. There was a guy named Abdurajak Janjalani whose nom de guerre was Abu Sayyaf, brother or father of the sword. He founded a group named after that name, Abu Sayyaf, in the Philippines. There were Chechnyans, there were South Africans, there were Islamics from all over the world that were united and came together, as much as progressive socialist communists did in, during the Spanish Civil War to fight fascism. Uh, the difference being after the Spanish Civil War, guys like Hemingway went to Paris to write books and these guys decided to turn their attention on us and blow us up, you know. So uh, we just missed it. And, and, and I think part of the missing it of it was that the CIA, which was then largely charged, and it still is with, you know, international, uh, you know, intelligence gathering, the CIA had been the partners to these guys. And one of the reasons, like, for example, Ali Muhammad got into the U.S., he was on a watch list. He wasn't supposed to get in, but he got into the U.S., as did blind Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, was another terrorist, uh, a holy man, a, 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 a beloved by a number of these groups. It was the spiritual head of both the Egyptian Islamic Jihad and the Ogama Islamiyah, another terrorist group. This guy got in, the Sheikh got in in July, and Ali Muhammad got in 
earlier by basically CIA people winking at their entry to the U.S., as, and many people see that as payback. So the reason that we ignored this was that our chief intelligence gathering agency of human intelligence on the ground, the CIA at the time, were in bed with these guys and completely didn't get it, didn't see the threat. Uh, and that is that's a huge um, blunder that the CIA and people of the CIA uh, have, you know, co responsibility for. But what happened after that, the lion's share of the failure to protect us in, in terms of the al-Qaeda threat happened at the hands of the Justice Department and the FBI. I'm Scott Horton. And my guest is Peter Lance. His website is peterlance.com. He's the author of the books A Thousand Years for Revenge and Cover Up. And we're talking about the history of Ramzi Youssef and Al Qaeda terrorism in the United States. We'll be right back after this break. <laughs> Scott Horton, and this is the Weekend Interview Show. I'm talking with Peter Lance. His website is peterlance.com, and he's the author of the books A Thousand Years for Revenge, International Terrorism, and the FBI, The Untold Story, and Cover Up What the Government is Still Hiding About the War on Terror. Now, I remember a news story from October the 28th, 1993, in the New York Times on the first page, all about how the FBI had an informant inside the first plot to bomb the World Trade Center back in the 1990s, and I found out, Mr. Lanson, reading your book, that the informant inside this terrorist ring had been recruited as far back as 1991. Yeah, his name was Imad Salem, and he was, he was another Egyptian. I want to emphasize, by the way, the importance of Egyptians in the Al-Qaeda hierarchy. You know, right behind bin Laden, you have Dr. Ayman al-Zawahiri, former head of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. You had Mohammed Atef who was bin Laden, who his uh, son had uh, married, his daughter had married bin Laden's son. He was a former Egyptian police chief. Uh, you have uh, Blind Sheikh Rahman. The Egyptians, all, all the way, were extremely significant in the creation of al-Qaeda. And uh, in any event, uh, Imad Salem was just working as a naturalized U.S. citizen, a series of odd jobs, just working in a hotel off Times Square when this incredibly bright, FBI agent named Nancy Floyd, who was a Texan, who was working Soviet counterintelligence in New York, happened upon him. And in, in the long story short, he uh, volunteered to go in for $500 a week to infiltrate the Sheikh's cell. And the Sheikh's cell was the cell that, that had been picked up by the Bureau in 1989 during those photographs. And it was the cell that essentially created the first World Trade Center bombing conspiracy and ultimately this bridge and tunnel plot. And uh, Salem was inside. He was going up to Attica to visit Al-Sayed Nasser, who had killed the rabbi. Nasser is asking him to blow up what they call the 12 Jewish locations around New York City, including the Diamond District. And he was pretending to be a bomb maker and giving this incredible treasure trove of information to the FBI. Well, a new head of terrorism was appointed in New York, a guy named Carson Dunbar, who was a really a desk jockey. He'd worked his way up in the New York office. He was like a paper guy, had no terrorism experience, hadn't been in the field for years, didn't like Nancy Floyd, didn't trust her or Salem. It was a personality issue, Scott, that in any other office wouldn't have mattered, except we're talking about national security here. And eventually, he, this guy, Salem, left. He withdrew. Because Dunbar changed the rules of engagement on him, made him take additional polygraphs, basically blew this guy out. And he predicted to Nancy in the fall of 92, he said, there's something going on now. Now, they had brought Ramzi Youssef in. Ramzi Youssef was a world-class bomb maker, an engineer educated in England, was extremely capable. As soon as Salem left, 
the their, the man with the eyes and ears of the bureau inside, they recruited this real bomb maker, and, and Salem caught wind of it, and he told them to follow two of these guys. One was called Mahmoud Abulima, a red-headed Egyptian, six-foot-two guy, and the other one was called uh, Mohammed uh, Salema. Now, if, if the names sound confusing. If you go to PeterLance.com, my website, lance.com, under terrorism, I have a 32-page timeline, which is was in the original book, A Thousand Years. And you can just scroll down and follow along with this narrative, and you'll see how many times these guys, these pictures of these guys show up on the FBI's radar. So Salema and Abulima were two of the guys from the 1989 Calvert and Long Island uh, uh, gun uh, firings. Uh, they also showed up as the getaway drivers the night of the, uh, the, the Nasser murder. I mean, they were absolutely connected. The FBI knew about them. Two of the agents from the New York Joint Terrorism Task Force had followed them. Uh, they'd even gotten a search warrant to go into Abu Lima's home, and they would, they called him the Teflon terrorist. He would just, like, shine these guys on again and kind of, you know, avoid them and lead them on wild goose chases, etc. So, Salema pleaded with Nancy, I mean, Ahmad Salem, please follow Mahmoud, the Red, and Salema. They will lead you to whatever's going on. And if the FBI had merely done this, Scott, in 1992, October, they would have followed these guys right to the door of Ramzi Youssef, who was then constructing this 1,500-pound urea nitrate fuel oil bomb that he put on the B-2 level of the World Trade Center the following February 26th. They were, uh, Salema was living with Yusuf, uh, Abu Lima was interacting ex as an expediter doing surveillance. If they had done basic Title III wiretaps on, on Abu Lima's phone, they would have found the, the phone, the payphone outside their bomb factory in Jersey City. They would have traced the surveillance calls from the World Trade Center. I mean, they could have nailed these guys. Little Salema got in three separate traffic accidents in the fall of 92. One time Yusuf is injured, goes to a hospital, and using an illegal phone card is, is ordering chemicals from his hotel room. They were unbelievably visible, and, and Andy Sipowitz on a typical episode of NYPD Blue could have caught these guys. You know what I mean? It sure. didn't take much, given the amount of intelligence and knowledge of the cell that they already had. And instead, the six, had inside. six people were killed and a thousand injured. Yeah, so, so now, the day after the Trade Center goes down, the FBI, I mean, they didn't go down, but they, he intended for, to, you know, for one tower to go into the other tower. Uh, Yusuf is at Kennedy Airport, about to escape, and he phones in a message to uh, one of the conspirators from the Calvert and Surveillance, a Rutgers grad named Ayad, and he said, add this to the threat letter. They'd already sent out their letter taking credit, but he wanted him to add this line and then send it again, which basically said, we know what we did wrong. We're going to come back, and these towers will not stand, okay? And literally, the night of the bombing, Scott, he's adding this code to the threat letter, which they sent out, and which the FBI, by the way, knew about because they got to this guy's computer a few days ago. All right. Hold it right there. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Peter Lance. His website is peterlance.com. He's the author of the book, A Thousand Years for Revenge, International Terrorism and the FBI. And uh, this is kind of an aside, but that title there, sir, is not a reference to, oh, gee, Islam's been plotting on killing us for a thousand years, and now we have to have a big war against them, right? No, it actually references a saying from Ramzi Yusuf's province of Baluchistan which is a, a country the size of France without a border that intersects Iran, Pakistan, and, and Afghanistan. And what they say there is, if it takes me ten centuries to kill my enemy, I will wait a thousand years for revenge. And uh, much of what we're facing is, is payback for the Crusades. Believe me, this is... <laughs> and, and it's an indication of what we're up against and, and, and how long they're prepared to wait. Uh, not, that, not that they've been literally the same people have been waiting for a thousand years, but you know what I, I mean. It's like... We're, we're, this is something that's much more bigger, much bigger than any geopolitical threat we've ever faced. Well, Michael Scheuer, the former, uh, an, formerly anonymous uh, yeah. CIA officer, he says that there's six main reasons that these people are at war against us. He says one is total support for everything that Israel does, no matter what. Yeah. Number two is support for kings and uh, generals and military dictators all, all across the Middle East. Secular Islamists, yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, third is uh, support for Russia, China, and India and their wars against Muslims. Fourth is pressure on Middle Eastern states to keep their oil prices artificially low. Uh, five is American troops on the holy Saudi Peninsula. And uh, what am I missing? Or was that six? 
Anyway, the point was that, um, according to Scheuer, none of this goes back to the Crusades. This is all about American foreign policy for the last 30 or 50 years. Yeah, but the, the, what I say when I reference the Crusades, what I'm talking about is the humiliation that many Islamics felt, uh, just like the humiliation the Germans felt after World War One. You know, and that the leaders of Germany played on the humiliation uh, that happened uh, to the German people and used that as grist for the mill, and that helped the Nazi war machine. You know, what what I'm saying is that the Islamic people, just like Christian people, are very proud, and and for many many decades, uh, centuries, they've been essentially uh, in their mind uh, from the days of the calip- the seventh century caliphate of Muhammad. Uh, they've been uh, denigrated and subjected to colonialism by Western powers. And that is something that if you read the, the fatwa, the famous bin Laden fatwa against the Jews and the Crusaders, he calls the West Crusaders for a reason. And he's playing on that kind of attitude. I agree with with Mike in many ways. I think the Israeli issue is like right at the top. But I would put the presence of U.S. troops in the Holy Land right around second. Because bin Laden, if you look at bin Laden's logic, when Ali Muhammad, by the way, uh, uh, pled guilty in, uh, in uh, October of 2000 uh, and was in, in front of a judge for a very limited period of time, the judge asked him, what, what, what's motivating you guys? What are your objectives? He said, our objectives are to get U.S. troops out of the Middle East. And we learned when the Marine barracks were, were, were bombed and Reagan pulled the U.S. troops out in 1983, we learned that you could be defeated. And that's ironic that the great Ronald Reagan, who's revered by many people, uh, especially now that he's gone, Ronald Reagan, it was a motivator for bin Laden in the strategy of creating these seismic events using bombs that would have mass casualties and using that as a threat to pull troops out. And what do you think happened, by the way, Scott? Bin Laden has already won part of this war because within two weeks of the invasion of Iraq, we announced we were pulling our troops out of Saudi Arabia, which was one of well, Bin Laden's primary objectives. It's, it's an interesting point, but it it's all really depends on the spin. I mean, in fact, I see here uh, in your bio that you actually made a movie out of Bob Woodward's book, Veil, The Secret Wars of the CIA, where he explains that Americans started the truck bombing in Lebanon as an attempt to kill the president's brother, and that the bombing of the Marines was revenge for that, and it was really our intervention that had started that fight in the first place. Well, what do you mean? You're saying that... So I'm saying that, saying that First of all, I, the, uh, the, I, I adapted Bob Woodward's book into a screenplay, and the movie never got made. Oh, I didn't. If Woodward, if Woodward is saying that the U.S. Embassy was bombed by... Who does, who does he say? But, not the embassy, the barracks, the Marine uh, barracks in Lebanon. Yeah, but the, the, the embassy was bombed in, uh, in April, a few months earlier. Okay, well, the way... Both, they're both done by Hezbollah, the Iranian party of God, the Shiite Hezbollah group did both of them. It wasn't done by the U.S. What are you, what are you saying? I don't understand. In the book Veil, The Secret yeah. Wars of the CIA, Bob Woodward says that the CIA recruited some guys to do the first truck bombing there in an aborted assassination attempt, or not an aborted, but a, a failed assassination attempt, that 80 people were killed. And the guy that they were trying to kill got away. Different event. That was a different event. That was Fedlala. There was a guy named Mohammed Fedlala who was uh, responsible for a number of the kidnappings at the time. In fact, the movie, uh, The Insider, the, the Al Pacino movie with Russell Crowe, uh, starts off with an interview of Lowell Bergman having of this guy Fedlala. That was a completely different event. Fedlala was a guy that both William Casey and Prince Bandar agreed had to go. And Bandar, according to Woodward, came up with a plot to kill him. He hired a former MI5 or MI6 operative who wired the building Fedlala was in and waited till Fedlala came back, ostensibly hit the hit the you know the the button and the building can take down and a number of people, including children, were killed and Fedlala wasn't even there. That's completely separate from and it was conducted by the Saudis with the winking of the CIA with with Bill Casey's kind of a, a, acknowledgement of forethought, but not. CIA participation, and that's completely separate from the bombing of the Marine Barracks. Marine Barracks went down by the party of God, and then X number of months later, having that happen and on the watch of Reagan, nobody thought to, wow, should we not harden the Marine Barracks? Should we not make it more difficult for somebody to park a truck bomb outside? No, they didn't. And 224 good men died in their sleep on a Sunday morning because of that negligence. And then beyond that, Reagan then hightailed it and pulled our troops out of Lebanon. And Ali Muhammad, in front of a federal judge in Southern District, and Ali Muhammad is the key 
operative of bin Laden says, because we learned the lesson that you could be defeated by truck bombs and have troops pull out, that gave us the inspiration for these other acts. Right. Well, and the thing, is, the fact, the reason I object is because the war party is always using that quote to say, see, that's why no matter how many of us get killed, we got to stay in there and fight them forever. And I'm just pointing out that if Reagan hadn't have put the Marines in Beirut, they wouldn't have got bombed in Beirut. Well, and I'm that not really it was justify the presence of the Marines. I'm telling you, I'm just saying to you that that was a. I, I, I'm not. It, it, one doesn't follow the other, Scott. The fact that I'm critical of Reagan for not hardening the Marine barracks and critical of Reagan for um, uh, pulling the troops. I, I didn't even say I was critical of him for pulling the troops out. I'm saying it was a lesson that they these these terrorists learn. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying that we should intervene. If you read A Thousand Years for Revenge, and I know you did, you'd know that I'm incredibly. I was incredibly critical of the invasion of Iraq, and you know I, I go out of my way to point that there were no weapons of mass destruction. I did this in September of '03, long before all these reports came out, sure. and I also said there was no connection to uh, 9/11. Well, and and I wasn't trying to necessarily be so hard on you, but I just want to make that point because people are often saying that you know they. We proved that we were cowards, and it inspired them. And so, basically, all I'm saying is, a lot of people basically paraphrase your same point, but use it to support endless warfare. And I'm just pointing out that it wasn't quite as simple as um, some guys got bombed and then we left. No, and I I agree, but I also think what we do is we compound errors. We make an error like invading uh, Lebanon at the time. And we make an error, I mean, like, you know, putting Marines in Lebanon and using the New Jersey, a big battleship like the New Jersey, which was a very theatrical, Reagan-esque kind of a thing to do, to, like, fire the 16-inch guns, in, you know, into the city where there are people, and many of them are innocent civilians. And then, and then uh, you know, the, to me, the, the fact that the, the embassy was bombed was one thing, but then and 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 if you look at the embassy bombing, by the way, in April, go Google that. You know, go Google Beirut embassy bombing in Lebanon, 1983. And you'll look at the Oklahoma City thing. It looks like the same building. I mean, the, the the pancaking of the building is extraordinary. The fact that we didn't weren't smart enough to harden the Marine barracks is another a mistake. And then you know, no one thought strategically of the consequences of immediate withdrawal. Well. In the case of Iraq, believe me, my feeling, my personal feeling is, is that if we withdrew from Iraq today, tomorrow, if we withdrew from Iraq, natural forces would take their course that the Sunnis and the Shiites who had been uh, at enemies and at each other's throats, especially the Sunnis and the Ba'ath Party members who they would have slipped their throats prior to the invasion, we've allowed to unite in this insurgency. But if we pulled out, if we become the reason that they, these, you know, that we remove the raison d'etre for this insurgency, believe me, there will be a certain amount of innocent life lost, which I abhor, but it will, the, 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 whatever happens, whatever shakes out in that country, uh, will ultimately be better than the prolonged, uh, prolonged Vietnam-like situation that we have right now. Because we are playing into the hands of these guys every day. We, by America expressing itself, particularly in uh, Iraq, uh, we play into the hands of those uh, radical Islamics that hate us and that want to, you know, unite the Islamic world against us. Well, right on. I'm really glad to hear you say that. You know, I do believe that going into Afghanistan was a valid uh, uh, reaction to 9-11. I think that bin Laden directed it. We knew better than anybody that it was a result of bin Laden, and bin Laden was in Tora Bora, and I think that we should have gone in to, uh, and I also think the Taliban was an incredibly reprehensive, you know, just repressive regime. We know that not just for the way they treated women, but the destruction of the, the you know, the Buddhist icons. They were just a terrible, uh, you know, just, and, and of course, they were the consequences, uh, you know, of, of, again, there were more blowback and fallout from the Afghan war. But we keep compounding our mistakes in foreign policy instead of rectifying them. And, uh, and again, getting into Afghanistan, too little, too late. Bin Laden moves, and you know, um, you know, we see what we see what the, the consequences are. Anyway. All right. Well, I took you off on a big detour there. Let's talk about Ramzi Youssef and how, when the uh, first uh, bombing of the Trade Center happened, uh, he got away scot free. And where did he go? Okay. So he went to to um, uh, ultimately after trying to 
He blew up a Shiite mosque in Iran that killed 26 mostly women. Then he went, ended up in the Philippines, and that was a very intentional ge geometric escalation in the war on terror by Al Qaeda. He was with his uncle Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and two other operatives. One is called Abdul Hakim Murad, and another one is called Wali Khan Amin Shah. Go to PeterLance.com, click terrorism, look at this timeline now. You'll see we're about a third of the way into the timeline. And they had, we now know, three plots in the fall of 94. Plot one was to kill the Pope, who was going to be there on January 12th with a series of pup truck bombs. The second plot we now know was the 9-11 plot, and they had seven targets. Originally, in my first book, I said I thought there were six, but there were seven, including the White House, and they included the Trade Center, the Pentagon, CAA headquarters in Langley, the White House, uh, an unnamed nuclear facility, and the Sears Tower in, in Chicago and the Transamerica Tower in San Francisco. There were up to 11 planes that they were going to use. There were 10 men training in U.S. flight schools. This is 1995, January, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the third plot was what they call the Bojinka plot. And this becomes very important for my the book, The Cover-Up, and tying into TWA 800. Bojinka was a completely separate, non-suicide plot. It had nothing to do with hijacking planes and flying in the buildings. It was a plot in which they would, the operatives, four, four operatives would get on the three planes each. So there'd be a dozen planes over a 48-hour period, and they would get on with the apparently innocuous components of what I call a little bomb trigger made from Casio, a Casio watch, diluted nitroglycerin, etc. And they would build this little trigger, put it over the center wing fuel tank, the fuel tank of the plane, so it would blow, put it under a seat above the tank, it would blow through the floor, destroy the plane, and then, you know, they would have gotten off on the first leg of a two-leg hop while this, plane took off and this destruction would have happened on the second leg. And that completely was separate, that plot, from 9-11. It was confused over the years, and some of the intelligence agencies after 9-11 seeking to, you know, uh, you know, exempt themselves from culpability said, well, how can anybody extrapolate, you know, uh, a, a plot of, you know, uh, you know, fly, they, originally it was reported they just were going to fly a small plane into CIA headquarters with, with uh, explosives. No, the entire 9-11 plot and the Bojinka plot, and the Pope plot. The details were given to Colonel Rodolfo Mendoza, Philippines uh, National Police extraordinary investigator, who I interviewed in March of 2002. All that is in cover-up. The entire, I mean, in the Thousand Years Revenge, all that information. He gave me declassified uh, Philippine intelligence documents, which prove that bin Laden, through his brother-in-law, Mohammed Jamal Khalifa, funded the plot. Uh, it was a heavy-duty al-Qaeda operation that was taking place in, in the Philippines. Uh, what the 9-11 Commission ended up doing in an effort to separate Ramzi Yusuf from the 9-11 plot. Why? Because if you separate Ramzi Yusuf from 9-11, you relieve the FBI of culpability for 9-11 because they didn't catch Yusuf the first time in 1992. You see what I'm saying? Right. That's the mindset, that's the logic, and you can see it across the board so that the 9-11, the first thing the Justice Department did was ignore the evidence from Colonel Mendoza. He gave them all this evidence in 1995 of this third plot, which became 9-11. They ignored it. Then when they indicted uh, of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Yusuf's uncle, for the Bojinka plot, they kept his name secret. Now, Scott, Yusuf was captured in 1995, about a month after he had a fire in his vanilla bomb factory. He's captured in Islamabad completely as a result of the terrorist reward for justice program in the State Department. A $2 million reward, young South African named Parker that Yusuf had recruited, saw it, uh, dropped a dime on him, and they got him, just like in the Old West, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, why didn't they put Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's name out there? I reported in my book that he was in the same 20-room guest house as Yusuf, gave an interview to Time Magazine, used his own name, had the time to hang around for that, and the FBI didn't get there in time. So he's in the wind now, plotting 9-11 to execute the plot of his nephew, and the FBI doesn't put his name out there, public hue and cry. Why didn't they? Why didn't they? Because they did, they wanted to separate, uh, they, they wanted to cover up their earlier negligence. They didn't want Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, they didn't want to associate Ramzi Youssef. They had Youssef in jail, they were going to end up trying him first for Bojinka, then for the, the World Trade Center plot. They were going to put him away ultimately for 240 years. They had already convicted the original Trade Center bombers and the, and the uh, blind Sheikh and the plot to blow up the bridges and tunnels, and they thought they had contained the Al-Qaeda threat. Okay, this is what... Right, KSM's only his uncle who lived with him at the time he was making bombs. No big deal there. Yeah, no connection. Well, 
believe me, there are other there are other things that I don't want to say right now that are going to be revealed in my new book that show prior knowledge of KSM going back to 1994, knowledge of the FBI of who he was, etc. That raise even more extraordinary questions about why they kept his name sealed. But listen to this. Again, you have to ask yourself, what is the logic of the same system that brought his nephew to ground, the public hue and cry? Again, they put his want poster on matchbook covers, right? Because everybody in the Middle East smokes, and yet. Khalid Sheikh's name first surfaced January 1998. You know when the first time anybody ever heard it? In a New York Times story on Yusuf's sentencing, January 9th of 98, and it's on the inside jump page of the story, like an afterthought, the third paragraph from the end. Today, the Southern District unsealed another indictment against the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, believed to be a relative of Yusuf. I mean, that's the first time the public, the New York Times, anybody knows about this guy. By then, we now know, 1998, he's already sinking with the Hamburg cell members. He's already got the plot well in motion. You know, so why did those were those two years lost from 19, three years really, from 95 to 98? The other thing that's incredible is there's another amazing screw-up, and this relates to, we'll get to the cover-up of the TW-800 in a minute, but the FBI finds out that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is in Qatar, or Qatar, he's in Doha, the capital, and they send the hostage rescue team over in 1996. This is the elite unit that the Bureau uses to grab people. Yeah, the Waco killers. We know who they are. Oh, wait a minute. I'll have no comment on that for me. Oh, oh okay, wait. hang on. We're going out to break here. We'll be right back. Don't take your guns to town, son. Leave your guns at home, Bill. Don't take your guns to town. All right, my friends, welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton, and I'm talking with Peter Lance, author of A Thousand Years for Revenge, International Terrorism, and the FBI, The Untold Story. Now, actually, that wasn't really fair when I called the hostage rescue team the Waco Killers. Actually, Bill Clinton sent the uh, Army's combat applications group, the Delta Force, to murder all those women and children up there. So I shouldn't be too unfair to the HRT. They're just the guys that drove over people's graves over and over again and that kind of thing during the siege. Uh, but anyway, quickly, you were telling us about the hostage rescue team in Qatar, and then I yeah, want to ask you, know, you it, real quick about Oklahoma City and Flight 800, too. Listen, it doesn't do us any good to... When a person joins the FBI, if they're a street agent or a brick agent or a member of the team, they're doing their job. They're trying the best they can. I've always celebrated, by the way, the, the people, the ground troops uh, of the Justice Department. It's management that I have my that I have my beef with. So, you know, you can't... What it, about uh, the tank drivers? Well, you know, anyone that is given an order that ultimately they believe violates their own religious principles or they believe they're, vi they're actually breaking the law under the Geneva Convention and the rules of, you know, military justice have the right to object, and then they, they can take the course. Right, so if they drive a tank into a house full of children anyway, then they're an individual and they're responsible for their actions. They are, and I'm not, but I'm not here to regurgitate Waco with you because I don't know enough about it. You have me on for another reason, and I'm just telling you, I don't want to be associated with, like, uh, ad hominem remarks that tar the entire hostage rescue team of the FBI because it's not fair. Well, like right? I said, it was the Delta Force that set the fire and shot the people, not the HRT. So anyway, I, I, I don't even want to comment on that because I don't know the specifics of it. So anyway, I think Waco was was a terrible thing, and I, I don't want to comment on it because I don't. I like to comment on the things I know about. And there's enough culpability in the in the part of the U.S. Justice Department during the years of Bill Clinton and Bush Senior and the current president to go around with respect to 9/11. So let's just cut to the chase. Okay. In Qatar in 1996. They know that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is there, and there are reasons they know he's there that I got into in my other book, uh, Cover Up. They, there's, there's an informant now, another informant they have in the lower Manhattan federal jail who's next to Ramzi Youssef, who's getting information from Ramzi Youssef. His name is Greg Scarpa, Jr. He's a Colombo crime family member. Youssef is passing notes to his friend Murad through this guy. The guy rats out Youssef and Murad. The FBI is photographing the notes, sets up a actual phone system where Yusuf can call outside thinking his calls are being passed through by the FBI, by the, excuse me, by the mafia, when in fact it's the FBI. But the Bureau screws up. Instead of having an agent that can listen in real time, they have an Arabic-speaking guy, and Yusuf is speaking Urdu and Baluchi in these obscure tongues. We know that he made at least one call to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. 
That call, the result of that call is what let the Bureau know that Muhammad was in Qatar, and they sent the hostage rescue team, but they were told to kind of cool their heels by the Qatari officials. And then, sure enough, the interior minister, Abdullah bin Khalid al-Fani, member of the ruling family of Qatar, the way the House of Saud runs Saudi Arabia, the, the al-Fani's run Qatar, Spirits Khalid Sheikh Mohammed out of the country to the Czech Republic, helps him create a false identity. Literally, the guy that ended up being the true ultimate executor of the 9-11 plot that his nephew created, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, is helped out of the country by a man who's in, still in government in this country where we have uh, put CENTCOM, Central, the Central Command for the War in Iraq is in Doha, Qatar. Now, you can't tell me that, that they know every single move we're making. If this guy, Al, uh, 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 Khalid bin Abdullah al-Fani, helped Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to get out, he was partial to al-Qaeda, and he's now the, he's the interior minister of the country where we have our Central Command headquarters. Incredible. Don't tell me they don't know every single move we're making over there. So all those good, earnest American men and women who are dying every single day in that country, their parents and their relatives should be asking the Pentagon how much intelligence is known ahead of time about what's going on. Right. Man, anyway. I'm sorry that we're out of time. I could definitely spend another hour. i got all kinds of questions here for you, but I will recommend your website to everyone, PeterLance.com. The book is A Thousand Years for Revenge. He's got pages and pages of declassified FBI 302 documents and a great timeline. Everybody look up PeterLance.com. Thank you for your time today, sir. Guys, good to be with you. Appreciate it. All right, we'll be back next week, y'all. Weekendinterviewshow.com.